Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Please welcome to the stage a member of AFA's Emerging Leader Program, John Thompson. Thank you. The topic of our next session is Mosaic Warfare, Actualizing Multi-Domain Operations. The Mosaic Force Design concept is more than just an information architecture. Mosaic offers a comprehensive model for systems warfare that encompasses requirements and acquisition processes, the creation of operational concepts, tactics, techniques, and procedures, and force presentations, and force allocation, in addition to combat operations. Mosaic is not simply about quickly closing kill chains. The attributes of a mosaic force design can help increase the speed of action across the U.S. warfighting enterprise, whether it involves quickly responding to urgent new requirements, integrating innovative and out-of-cycle capabilities, or operational planning. The guiding principles and technologies that underpin a mosaic force design will help enable the United States to prevail in long-term competitions with great power adversaries. Our panel this afternoon will discuss how mosaic warfare is actualizing multi-domain operations to better serve the warfighter. Our panel includes <laughs> Woo. Lieutenant General David A. Deptula, United States Air Force retired, Dean, AFA's Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. Yeah. Heather Penny, Senior Resident Fellow, AFA's Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. And Dr. Tim Grayson, Director, Strategic Technology Office, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Copies of their bios are in your program. Before I turn it over to Heather Penny, please remember slido.com with the code AWS20. Ma'am. And we have verified uh, that that uh, technology, those apps are working and the Wi-Fi is working as well. So we all know what the pacing threat is, right? What's important to note about the threats that we see from China and what they're doing today, the technologies they're developing today, is not about widget versus widget. Simply developing technologies to counter their technologies is going to lead in defeat to the United States. What we need to understand is that China is using those technologies, A2AD, uh, in order to be able to execute systems confrontation and systems warfare. Ironically, we can thank General Deptula for this and his incredible systems campaign in Operation Desert Storm, which China went to, to school on in order to develop their own unique philosophy. So we know that it, above and beyond simply attrition-type warfare or anti-access area denial, that there's, they are truly seeking to be able to blind and paralyze our ability to operate. They've also had the last 30 years to observe how we conduct our operations and the technologies and operational and information architectures we use to support those operations. So we know that they will be attacking our networks, they will be targeting our critical nodes of those operational systems. We'll also know that in terms of uh, our operational architecture, they'll be deliberately trying to disrupt our ability to share that information, close those kill chains, and doing all the tipping and queuing and kill chain activities that need to be done. And of course, in, all, in the, all of this, they'll be seeking to extend our OODA loop by disrupting our decision, by disrupting our ISR capabilities, and this is how they intend to be able to collapse our ability to execute operations. So mosaic warfare implies a shift away just from, from simply advanced technologies to developing a force design philosophy to be able to survive, counter, and achieve victory through offense in systems warfare. What does this mean? In order to be able to move away from those lucrative targets, we need to be able to disaggregate or virtually disaggregate the functionality on our weapon systems. This means that although we will continue to have highly sophisticated, very capable multifunction platforms in the battle space, we will also complement those capabilities through virtual disaggregation. That means being able to take those platforms and share the information off those platforms in a functionally specific kind of way, as well as put uh, platforms into the battle space, above this battle space, and surrounding the battle space that are more simple function as well. 
We need to have quantity of nodes in order to be able to complicate the adversary's problem set. Every node in our operational system has to provide value to our combat operations. What this does is creates a, a, a complicated and even confounding problem for China because no matter what node they target, what network they target, that information continues to be shared through other nodes, replicated through other networks, and therefore we can survive platform and information and network attrition and still be able to close those kill chains because they come, become kill webs. So that functionality is connected through those networks and it's not linear, it's not sequential, and it's not self-contained. That's the value of the kill web, right? We also know that we need to have command and control at the forward tactical edge of the battle space. We cannot do that kind of coordination at the very aft end and we have to begin building in that battle management philosophy at the very edge, including the processing at the very edge. Sharing information and sharing those kill chains through uh, multi-connected networks is important, but unless you have someone synchronizing, orchestrating that ensemble, it's like little kids at a soccer game. Everyone runs to the ball. We can't have that. So we need to ensure that we're continuing to have the battle management piece built into the architecture and the operational concept from the very beginning so that our information networks uh, also mirror that. Again, we've already talked about the kill, waves, kill webs, not just simply the kill chain. And again, this allows us to ensure that we can withstand platform information and network attrition and not have our system collapse. So many of you may be familiar with this very abstracted uh, architecture that we employed um, not only last uh, at our last conference in September, but also within our report. Don't get hung up on the symbols here, right? These are deliberately abstracted. Uh, we encourage you to pick up our report at uh, the AFA in the Mitchell booth to read more fully through this. But what we've done here is, is really tried to demonstrate uh, that we, how you connect the observation nodes, all of our sensors across the battle space in LEO, in the battle space, around the battle space. How do we begin to connect those so that they can cross queue, collaborate, upgrade information, be able to send that to an orientation node that can begin to build that common battle space picture from the tactical edge backwards. The decision nodes are battle management elements. They need to have uh, decision aids, probably powered by artificial intelligence, to help them begin to orchestrate that ensemble of capability. And then finally, our action nodes. So how do we, again, begin to share and connect all of that information across the battle space in a way that always provides resiliency regardless of what the adversary is doing to pressure us. So that is a recap of our mosaic warfare study. I know we've gone fast and furious. You've heard a lot about uh, multi-domain operations, uh, joint all-domain command and control, uh, multi-domain command and control as well. Uh, it's crucial as we move forward into uh, combat operations and warfare operational concepts that we begin to understand how to leverage that information. So to continue this conversation, I'll sit down. I'd like to uh, begin to begin the dialogue with Joan Deptula and Dr. Grayson. So gentlemen, as we discussed er earlier, or as I just mentioned, there's been a lot of focus on multi-domain operations, command and control, joint uh, all-domain command and control. How do you see these initiatives as connected to your vision for mosaic uh, warfare and, uh, and combat cloud? Dr. Grayson? So uh, thanks, Heather. And, and, and first of all, before I dive in, I want to thank the Mitchell Institute uh, first of all, for and AFA for the opportunity to be here talking about mosaic warfare, and specifically for the the study that uh, Mitchell's done for us uh, to help flesh out uh, this mosaic warfare concept. Uh, really, this partnership epitomizes one of the original motivations for mosaic warfare. DARPA was asked a few years ago by then Deputy Secretary Shanahan to help with a modernization study for the department. And one of the key findings that came out of that is the need for a mission-centered approach to modernization. We can't just have warfighters out innovating new operational concepts who define a bunch of gaps and throw those over a fence to developers who are then going to go innovate on technologies and capabilities. It, the whole concept of a mission-centered department is to get both sides at the table. And this partnership here 
represents that. So DARPA's there driving the technologies, and Mitchell's been helping us put that in a warfighter's uh, uh, construct. So to, to that end, and, and to, to your question, Heather, I really see, uh, first of all, I was incredibly excited by the, uh, uh, the comments in the MDO panel this morning. Uh, they they uh, caused me to rethink everything that I'm going to say today, but we're perfectly aligned. They were, they were great, great straight men for what we're doing. I fundamentally see Mosaic as building some of the technologies to enable those concepts of JADC2 and MDO. Uh, we're trying to build those piece parts that enable all of the aspects the generals talked about this morning that are necessary for those multi-domain operations. Um, most notably, we're bringing a couple of key attributes that they, they really, I was excited to hear them talk about. Uh, the, the first of all is this notion of not eating the whole elephant in one bite. We are specifically trying to develop technologies in Mosaic that allow us to, to build pieces even out of things we have today. Uh, how do we create federated systems as opposed to waiting until when we have the next, you know, the ideal architecture? Because frankly, I tell you, even if we do a great job building the ideal architecture, it'll be for one instance in time and a couple years later we'll think, wow, uh, we need to go build a new architecture. So we need to be constantly evolving, we need to be constantly adapting in a very federated manner. So that's a key attribute of Mosaic. Uh, we're also working on uh, building technology, using technology to get at that human cognitive problem that, that they mentioned as part of MDO and JADC2. So we're doing a lot of new technology to aid in planning tools, to, to apply AI to automation that makes the job of the warfighter easier and reduces that complexity of these kind of operations. So the bottom line is they're very complementary. Thank you. You know, uh, sir, I'm going to interrupt for just a moment because I want to pull on a thread, uh, Tim, that you had uh, mentioned in the course of your uh, conversation is, uh, is that left of conflict attributes, right? Like the force composition, uh, composition how, do you, how does the Air Force rapidly compose heterogeneous uh, uh, forces that are not necessarily pre-planned in the O-plan or the TIPFID, but are really customized based off of what that particular conflict requires, what the operational plan for that concept is, and so forth. So can you talk a little bit about some of those things? Because everyone's really excited about the combat operations. But there's a really important and heavy lift uh, in this not so sexy stuff. So, so I, I like I like to say that that the mosaic warfare technologies apply uh, left of H hour. So you know today we think about doing force development as this this you know long term joint staff type thing that happens and, and, and things that happen in schoolhouses and battle labs. Uh, we think about the development of architectures as something that happens over years, if not decades, in acquisition organizations. What we fundamentally want to do is bring an incredible speed dimension to this notion of multi-domain operations, where we can have uh, actual, no kidding, warfighters right out there at the tactical edge, uh, creating new force constructs, wiring together these system of systems kill webs at time of need, Think about building a machine-to-machine -machine kill web the same way t uh, today you do the, uh, uh, the planning for your next ATO cycle and doing mission planning. Make that technical element a piece of mission planning, and that's what we're trying to enable. Very good. Um, General Deptula, uh, you've really been the visionary, sort of the thought leader from Combat Cloud for, for networked operations. So, so for me, uh, multi-domain operations, joint all-domain command and control, is very much has its foundation in combat cloud. Um, but, you know, lately, lately we've seen uh, the chief and the secretary make some sig serious trade-offs in the budget between force structure and the, the foundational technologies for networked operations. So can you uh, speak to this potential as well as some of the risk involved with these decisions and trade-offs? Yeah, thanks for that. Not so softball question in front of the Air Force <laughs> leadership. Um, I, I think everyone in here is very familiar with the fact that uh, both the Secretary and the Chief of Staff have stated over and over and over again um, that the Air Force has been given much more mission than it has been allocated resources to accomplish that mission. Um, now, this situation applies to both near-term challenges and long-term challenges. A couple of years ago, Congress asked the United States Air Force and a couple other folks to do an evaluation of just, okay, 
what does the Air Force need to satisfy the demands of the national uh, defense strategy? Um, the response was 386 operational squadrons. What we have today is 312. That's a 24% deficit. So the challenge becomes, okay, how are we going to deal with this situation? The essence of your question, um, the leadership of the Air Force is sort of obliged to take a look at the, the significance of future challenges versus current challenges. And as long as the Department of Defense continues to obligate funding inside service stovepipes, the leadership took a calculated risk in shifting uh, and, 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 and basically um, uh, retiring uh, old systems and capabilities to free up the money to invest in future capacity and capability uh, to the tune of $21 billion uh, in the, uh, the FIDEP. Um, so uh, it is a challenge, uh, but here's the fact of the matter. Y you know, the Congress, the American public, uh, the entire defense enterprise can increase the size of the defense budget. By the way, my answer applies to a degree to all the services, but none more, none has been as affected as much as the Air Force. But we ought to be pragmatic, too. We don't see that happening in the near term. The other option is we can reduce the demands of the national defense strategy. The likelihood of that happening is not very great. We can continue to accept risk as we have in this disparity between what we need and what we have as we have over the last two, three decades. But the future is getting much, much more dangerous. Um, ergo, that's why the leadership made the decision that they did. And we're gonna be in this quandary until the department begins to see the reality of what I just laid out for you and begins to look at um, analysis across the services to invest in what best meets the needs of the challenges of this new national defense strategy. And how do you see the roadmap that, that the chief and the secretary have laid forward as well as the, the good work that everyone's been doing on JADC2, how do you see that connected to your original vision for Combat Cloud and now as we've developed Mosaic and moving forward with that? You know, it's a great question. First, I would, you know, in the Air Force, we do flight plans. The Army does roadmaps. <laughs> um, uh, but the fact of the matter is the Mosaic Warfare approach is the per perfect fit for these concepts because it's domain and system agnostic, okay? Said another way, the whole point of mosaic warfare is the ubiquitous and seamless sharing of information, all right? Because it's that information that allows us to get a decision, a decision advantage ahead of our adversary. So join all domain command and control, multi-domain operations, joint warfare, whatever you'd like to, combat cloud, whatever you'd like to call it, this is all about the foundation of sharing information across the battle space. I'll add one more thing in that I there are some out there that go, well, wait a second, you're, you're creating this exquisite architecture uh, and I think General uh, Hurrigan or, or maybe uh, General Shaughnessy made this statement this, this morning is that we need to presume that the normal state of doing business is that we're not connected which gets to a fundamental change in the way we do command and control and empower our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marine to take the initiative uh, in the absence of that. But uh, as Tim said, uh, this whole issue of how do you get to mosaic warfare, I'm reminded of the fact or the statement um, that, you know, th this is a journey, it's not a destination. And we're headed in the right direction. And if I can just pile on that a, a little bit, I, I think w what Dave just said is an absolutely critical point. We can't wait for perfection. Uh, a lot of the way that we're looking at doing these architectures, if you like, uh, is, in a, is in a very, uh, it's not trying to plan it and say, here's the optimized architecture. It's really turning it around and saying, let's give the tools, the warfighter, to at an information sharing perspective. If I lose this sensor over here, Give me information about what other sensor could replace it. Don't plan that in advance. I don't know how the situation's gonna evolve. I don't know what the adversary's gonna throw at me. 
And this is where AI uh, this and is exactly where AI. This is where learning is adaptive all networking. In and they're all part of that. Complement the system. That's right. Absolutely. And so we have a question from the audience um, that how does Mosaic scale in jammed or contested communications environment when it fundamentally leans upon networked and shared operations in order to be a, a force multiplier? G great question. And it's fundamental to this approach. First, we have to stop thinking about connectivity only relying on radio frequency data links. Th this is where Tim comes into play. We're talking about communication and connectivity in multiple diverse modalities. So we, we don't, it's not just an issue of making the next best version of Link 16, all right, and chasing the, the kinds of, of jammers and systems that an adversary can disrupt that way. Th this is capitalizing on laser comm, uh, aircraft that communicate not direct link with another unit, but shoot up a signal to an overhead that passes it halfway around the world that downlinks it and passes it through a fiber optic cable back to another transmission site. Uh, so very different sets of architectures that then we've come to rely on and develop over the last century. We're, we're calling it C2 of C. How can we go out and be opportunistic? What links are available? What radios are a particular system using? What, uh, uh, if something's being jammed and drops out, where is there another pathway to get information to someone who needs it? And we're actually right now building the technology in some of our programs to do things to exactly that end, to be able to go out and automatically find what the right link is and then create a virtual link between that sensor and that shooter, regardless of what the sets of networks are that it has to go over. Well, and I think also um, the ability to have graceful degradation in operations, right? So this is one of the reasons why uh, I personally believe that we are not going to have the kind of centralized control uh, and execution uh, that we've been experienced over and, and been habituated to over the last 20 years. So that as we begin to see some of that contested operations going down, we'll both have C2 of C, so command and control of communications. We'll have maneuver in network and maneuver in information as well. But we'll also need to empower small teams at the tactical edge, which is why you heard me foot stomp earlier, the need to be able to have that battle management human in the loop, decision making at the very forward edge of the battle space, because that provides the resiliency. And also, as we begin to move forward, we also have to, we need to be aware that we're not going to be getting rid of all of our legacy systems all at once. So having the, the redundancy and uh, the heterogeneity of network systems, again, complicates the adversary's problem set in denying us information. Uh, six words for you. Unified command, distributed control, <laughs> decentralized execution. <laughs> It's what happens when you get old. Uh, you know, I, I didn't want to mess up my six-word count. But that's what we need to move toward. Everyone needs to understand that we've got a unified plan. Everyone's on board. Everyone understands it. This is the whole notion of mission command, mission type orders. Um, but the, the control needs to be distributed. So, you, you know, you're not calling back to the chaos to ask mother may I anymore. You understand the plan. You understand your region and what you can do, and then you go and you execute it. That's been the strength of the American way of war, and that's that warfighters at the edge can take initiative. And, and as Heather alluded to, the last 20 years, um, we've kind of shifted from uh, the philosophy of centralized control, decentralized execution, centralized control, centralized execution. That was the Soviet command and control model that we all grew up talking about was the worst way to do business and we proved that multiple times uh, in, 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 in contingencies going back to Desert Storm. And I think what's so important with what we're trying to do with the, all the Mosaic Warfare projects gets back to this mission center department idea. Everything Dave is talking about with decentralized execution, with mission command, starts with a warfighting construct. It starts with the operational principles, but at the same time, we're there trying to say, okay, how can we take AI and give a decision aid 
that helps someone out at the tactical edge understand the complexity of what his or her role is in this large dynamic battle space to execute with a sense of mission command. So it's a great synergy between the technology and the operational construct. We've got another um, audience question which is related to this topic. Uh, with the advent of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other emergency, uh, emerging technology, can we automate or eliminate the outdated ATO creation cycle or other AOC uh, duties? So I know, Tim, you've got some programs that are sort of moving in this direction, and it's very connected to the composition of Mosaic Force. So uh, th this is going to be a little bit heretical for, for DARPA, the, you know, the knee-jerk answer is, yeah, of course, we don't need any of that. Um, actually, I do think that planning cycle is important, but what we're looking at is changing the, compl uh, the complexion of what that planning cycle is. So, so instead of trying to you know, pre-plan exact assignments and exact air lanes and exact actions down at the fine grain level, what we see the future being is having those, you know, think of it as ATO planning tools, be it today what would be more like force development. You know, could I go in based upon the situation as it's uh, unfolding and say, okay, in the next 24 hours, yeah, things I've got aren't working right. My tip fid's all messed up. The bad guy threw a couple of curveballs at me. What do I do? And we're actually looking at building the planning tools to say, okay, great. How could I actually compose a new squadron? Could I go in and define a new hybrid squadron inside that ATO cycle? Now, to do that, everything that we think of today as being an ATO has to be completely automated and happening in real time. And, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. So we've got a series of programs working all the way from, you know, say, an AOC level of how you automate a lot of those kind of tasking down to things uh, that would be ATO-ish, like a new program we're just releasing to do uh, real-time deconfliction of airspace. So if, if I want to go do a major diversion from my original plan uh, or, you know, say uh, in a joint sense, uh, you know, someone's going to go fire, the Army's going to go fire a long-range uh, 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 artillery or missile strike that's going to go right through our airspace. We're looking at how you do that deconfliction in real time instantaneously without having to go back to the ATO cycle. Well, bless you, Tim, for your original statement that we, you need to have a plan. Too many people have been beaten up on the ATO process for too long. Look, we collapsed it from 72 hours to less than 24 hours back in WW Desert Storm. Okay, how long is the Army components planning cycle? Anybody know? Or the Marines? Or the Navy? Um, days, weeks, months. All right, so yeah, we need to get to as close to real time as you can, but you still need to plan. The plan's nothing more from a starting point from which one can begin to deviate. But until everyone understands what the plan is, um, it's difficult to achieve unified execution. So as we move into the plan and having more adaptive planning and collapsing that, uh, that time cycle, uh, we have a question about combat support, the combat, combat support community in Mosaic Warfare. So is that a weak link? So you, you've just touched on one of my soapboxes. So um, I know. You know, DARPA, DARPA, DARPA does not do policy, we do technology. But one of the things that we're doing with Mosaic Warfare is to at least get people thinking about new policy and doctrinal things. And this notion of combat support is right smack in the middle of it. Um, I, I have been running around advocating for a long time for something I'm calling mission integration operations. What is the operational unit, the combat support unit? And, and quite frankly, I don't know for sure if it actually sits on an operations side or sits on a, met, a, a maintenance side, but it's something right up there near the operational edge that I, I figuratively called the geek squad for the military. You know, what is the technically empowered unit that if we're doing things like, oh, I, I've got to rejigger this plan that normally today would be years in, in advance. I've got to uh, reset uh, whatever kinds of, of AI rule sets were going into my adaptive comms or in my autonomous systems. Uh, something we may get further into in the discussion if we have time. The training element. Uh, someone who can take, uh, I love the question earlier about the uh, young officer who was asking about video gaming. How could we take something, say for example, like a video game environment and, and tee that up 
to go in and train the airmen who have to go fly that fight with a whole bunch of new things just put in front of him, him or her. Okay? That combat support element, that mission integration unit is going to be critical. And right now in our current force structure and frankly in our current way of doing resource planning, it doesn't exist. It lives in the seams. Is it technology? Is it operations? Is it, is it, is it 3,600 money? Is it, is it uh, operations and sustainment money? Uh, I will put a little bit of a shout out uh, to one of our more mature programs uh, that has built a tool called Stitches. And uh, without being, you know, geeking out into the technical weeds, it is software that writes software. Th this problem we talk about with interoperability and our boxes not understanding each other and systems not being able to pass data to each other, this Stitches tool generates the software that does auto translation. So you can take two incompatible things and have them work together machine to machine. Now, that still takes a human to use that tool. And, and to use that tool is the equivalent of, for instance, in the EW world today, where you talk about making mission data files. So you could think about having translator patches that are just like mission data files. One of the things DARPA is doing, working with the Air Force, is helping to transition this technology in an incredibly, I think, incredibly unique way. We're, we're helping to stand up what we're calling the Stitches Warfighter Application Team, which, if, if all, everything works out, will live on sort of the ACC operations side of the world, not the RDT&E acquisition side of the world specifically there to work on promulgating this type of, of combat support tool out to operational elements. And since, since you, you, you stepped on my, my uh, soapbox, I'll say one last thing about this. I've got to give kudos to the Air Force for being way out in front on this type of issue uh, with the creation of the software uh, engineering squadrons and the software engineering groups. Uh, that was one of the last things that uh, Secretary Wilson did before her her term ended there, and, and absolute kudos for doing that, because I think that gives us a, a, a beachhead for this kind of combat support. Just real quick, we can get some more questions. I, I d you heard General Brown this morning talk about uh, the importance of logistics in the Pacific. Well, logistics is important everywhere, but the fact of the matter is, and what he related is, look, we're still, we're still conducting logistics and treating it as we have uh, in the last century. And, and, and Tim is working on trying to change the technologies and concepts so that we can become much, much more agile uh, in the distribution of materials that are fundamental to warfare. You all are familiar with the statement that, you know, amateurs talk tactics and professionals talk logistics. Um, and that's true because we can't conduct and execute those tactics without the proper logistical infrastructure. And, and, and since you brought up logistics, I mean, the, the program that we have in logistics is about information back to combat cloud, information about logistics. It's a logistics essay. Right now, uh, I'm not a warfighter, so maybe I'm totally off base here, but my perception is if you're a three, you really don't have any insight into what truly you have there ready to go. You, you have your assigned tip fid, and you hope your loggy and your maintenance folks have, have gotten stuff there that you're supposed to have. I, I liken Mosaic to that m uh, moment in the Apollo 13 movie where the chief engineer says, here's what you got. And he points to all the stuff lying out there on the table and you say, one mission, get those astronauts home safely. Today, the reality is, if we wanted to d enable that for the warfighter, that first step in that movie scene doesn't exist. We don't really know what the parts are on the table. So the logistics awareness is a critical part of the problem. So another question from the audience regarding um, tactical edge execution, right? Wh how, does, how does Mosaic uh, influence, change, or integrate with more centralized type operations like space or cyber? What, what <laughs> it depends. Um, and we haven't realized um, the command and control architecture that this connectivity is going to enable. We, we, we have to get to the fundamental basis and understand and develop um, over this journey, um, you know, breaking down the individual system stovepipes that currently exist to share info. Okay, so when you share information, that calls for a completely different command and control construct. Again, this morning it was raised in, in the panel 
Uh, it's not just matching sensors to shooters. By the way, every shooter should be a sensor and every sensor should become an effector, which changes the way we think. Um, and, and then it's going to get to, it's not just deconfliction, but it's optimization of employing the right system at the right place at the right time. That's where AI is going to come into play. But we don't have the answers yet. Uh, that's what the whole process of conducting the research that DARPA is doing is going to uh, head us in the right direction. So we got an app for that. Uh, so there we have a program called ACK, Adaptive Cross-Domain Kill Webs, that's starting to look at the C2 problem. And, and to the point about is it centralized or at the edge, the way we're approaching this from a technology standpoint is say, don't care. Uh, we're building a, a, an abstracted software framework that's basically like an Uber app to help you start matching up elements of the battle space to a particular mission need. And, and we're th with, uh, for the program's purpose, we're looking a lot at kill chains, so it's a sensor and a weapon, but to Dave's point, it could be any number of different operations. The, the key there is at the end of the day, even though we're going to demonstrate it with certain types of scenarios, it's a piece of software. And now, back to mission-centered construct. What's the military concept that goes along with the technology? That then allows the warfighters to start experimenting, well, who do I want to give this app to? Am I only going to let this app sit in an AOC? Or am I going to put the app in a cockpit? Or am I even going to give the app to a satellite constellation or a UAS? From the technology standpoint, we don't care. That's a doctrinal and a policy thing that we can work out together. I'd like to ask a little bit more about the notion of experimentation because on Monday you and I were together visiting some industry and uh, you had mentioned how important experimentation is in developing uh, a rapid feedback loop between technology enabling operational concepts and operational concepts informing the development of technology. Would you speak a little bit more about that and how yeah. industry can help? Uh, absolutely. Thank, thanks for asking that, Heather. So I, I, I uh, one of the, the real reasons, I was, uh, one of the, a lot of reasons I was excited to, to be here at this conference, but a specific one is I've got a request for everyone here in the room from senior leaders to airmen to uh, the industry folks here. Um, over the next year or two, we are making a major push. We have enough programs and enough technology, enough starting technology, uh, that is beginning to create the opportunity to conduct these experiments. Uh, whether it's in a constructive modeling and sim environment or pieces of it actually in, in a, a live flight type of environment. Uh, while I have funding to bring f to forth to experimentation, uh, I don't to do the full-scale campaigns that we need to really kick the tires on Mosaic. Wh one of the key challenges, uh, a, a typical DARPA program for, for people who haven't worked a lot with DARPA, will end with some big bang dem demonstration. It's really more of a demonstration than an experiment where we say, hey, something works and we can declare victory and hand it off to someone. Um, because we're testing the technology in those traditional programs, it, we, we t the, the exercise itself tends to be very scripted. Um, we can't go out there with a scripted, planned exercise to test Mosaic. We need to bring in the notion of uncertainty. We need to bring in that element of adaptability. So, so I'm looking for experimentation opportunities where there is a fundamental operation, a fundamental activity going on. And then we bring in our Mosaic technologies as a ride along that says, how can we flex? How can we use these tools to allow those warfighters to stop what they're doing at this moment, go build the separate kill chain, and then go back to doing their fight, as opposed to doing this, this dog and pony uh, uh, type standalone thing. So we're looking for opportunities to partner with people, whether that is military exercises, whether it's uh, uh, war games and experiments, and certainly to your folks uh, from industry, uh, you know, we're asking everyone out there that has the resources that if there are things you're doing to experiment with your own technologies and there are opportunities to partner there, we'd, we'd love to talk to you. General Deptula, um, as we worked through this mosaic research together, we clearly focused a lot on the air component, but from your experience in Desert Storm when you were dealing with the other different components, uh, air and, and sea, land, um, I would really appreciate, and this is a question from the audience, hearing a little bit more of your thought on how JADC2 may impact the Joint Force Command and Control structure. If everything is talking to everybody and it's completely agnostic regarding what domain it's coming from, what does that then mean for the Joint Force components? 
Um, it's an excellent question, um, and I'm going to uh, approach answering it by going back to some fundamentals that uh, I, I think everyone in, in here understands, but too few folks on the second and third floors in the Pentagon and across the Potomac um, over in that big Capitol uh, building uh, don't necessarily understand. Um, and that is fundamental to the notion of jointness is the importance of the separateness of each of the services. Jointness is not homogeneity. It's not going along to get along. Jointness is using the right force at the right place at the right time. And so a joint force commander, if he or she is performing their duties appropriately, they'll reach out and they'll look to each one of the service components and ask the soldier, sailor, airman, marine, uh, and depending on the case, Coast Guard person, um, how can you bring your expertise and perspective to solving this joint force challenge that we have? So it, we, we have to be very careful, and I think may perhaps the fundamental uh, uh, incentive for asking that question was, well, we are, we are moving to a much more homogeneous uh, set of operations. No, that's not the point. Um, you, you, we, we, it takes 25 years uh, to build a competent division commander, uh, a surface action group commander, a joint force air component commander, or a marine expeditionary force commander. Okay, you know, the, you know a, a while back, and, and forgive me, because this is one of my hobby horses, you know, there was a, sta a statement floating around the Pentagon, well, systems need to be born joint. That's ridiculous. You can't be born joint. You need to have the separateness to bring together those perspectives in order to come up with an optimal plan. So I, I hope that sheds some light. The idea is not to split everything up uh, and shake it into this container uh, and then come up with a command and control system to tie it all together. No, the individual service component perspectives and advice will inform the unified command plan that's going to be executed. But then this ability to ubiquitously and seamlessly share information allows the joint task force to operate in a much, much more effective way. Again, seeking decision advantage quicker uh, and more comprehensively than an adversary. And, and that's exactly exactly the way that we're building, the, the looking at building the tools. Um, you know, one of the, uh, I, I mentioned that ACK program earlier. The way we envision that joint battle space playing out is the default, and this gets back to the ATO question as well, the default is the plan. The individual forces, the individual operational units start with a, their baseline task and their baseline way of knowing things. Mosaic is about how do we flex? How do we deviate in real time from that plan? So, so that, that joint command and control then becomes something that's by exception. The issue is, boy, I want to be able to really grab hold of that thing and do it fast, not have to go back to some committee to figure out, okay, now we're going to go be joint. That's where I would say the ability to do that at the instant is where there's a, a nature of a join, uh, being born uh, joint enabled, but not common. You know, another, another term we use for mosaic is monolith busting. We hate commonality because we think that just makes the bad guy's problem easier. Absolutely, and ultimately mosaic warfare is about confounding, not just complicating, but confounding uh, the problem set for um, any adversary and doing so in an unpredictable and a surprising manner that always leverages the power of information in order to be able to create uh, surprising and unpredictable, uncertain uh, 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 kill chains that the, the adversary simply can't solve. Gentlemen, we've got two minutes. Um, any closing remarks for the audience? Real quick, um, <laughs> because people are going to say, all right, or I hope some of you are thinking, okay, great. This kind of gives us a macro level. What's the next step to actualize this concept? Uh, and, and I'm going to give you a macro level answer. Uh, we need a champion. We need a champion at the head of the Department of Defense in the body of the Secretary of Defense who embraces this vision and enforces the service, uh, the services approaches to actualizing it. 
uh, once again, there are going to be different approaches in each one of the services. But as Tim said, they, they've got to be uh, integratable. Uh, and, and so that's extraordinarily important. Uh, you know, the services organized, training, and equipment, they'll modify that toward their domains. Uh, but we need to all accept and get on board with a common vision. Yeah, I, I've, I've got uh, three next steps to toss out to you. The first, we have already talked about experimentation. We've got to start experimenting this. If we don't start trying to use it, especially now that the first uh, out of the tranche technologies are starting to get to a usable level, we won't figure out how this actually all comes together. Uh, the second thing, uh, to echo what Dave just said, and I'm going to go back to my favorite soapbox about the, this combat support, there's a separate side of combat support uh, that again, we, we're, we're lacking good terminologies that don't become bureaucratized, but the notion of a mission integration manager, the, the, the senior level that doesn't have to do mother may eyes across each individual so stovepipe to champion this uh, is critically missing. So we need to figure out what that is. Uh, the third thing I'll, I'll toss out to industry, and, and this is not unique to Mosaic, um, but one of the challenges uh, that we have uh, is, is um, People talk about standards. You know, I want standard. I want to know what the standard is. Back to, I want to know what the common thing is that we all have to comply to. That's not what we need because that locks us into to the, to a monolith. But what we do need is best practices. Okay, so if, if, the, if standard means best practice, then that's what I need all of you in industry to think about for the next step here. Uh, to, to make things more uh, ready to be interoperable, uh, one of the things we've seen is that when we go do these inter integration hackathons, uh, most of the work is the homework done in advance. Most of the program office and, is in, and vendors don't understand their own systems. Figuring out what interfaces they have and characterizing those interfaces is hard. Build clean interfaces. I don't want a government-owned interface. I don't want you to comply to a standard, but build a clean interface and understand it. Write software that's partitionable. One of the ways we get to the services, each understanding what they're going to do, is to, to uh, use what the commercial world calls microservices. That's the way Uber does what they do. So the new software can be this headless thing that plugs into people's individual systems. A and, and then the, the third thing from a best practice is user experience. In our acquisition process, uh, you know, we, we don't have a requirement that says make software that doesn't suck. Uh, but in the commercial world, that's the single most important thing. And it's one of the reasons our training problem is, is so hard. So, so I ask industry to think about those best practices. And I think if, if we start making headway on that, we'll make this real. Thank you, Tim. If I could please ask the staff to put the Mitchell URL back up on the, uh, the screen so that the audience can see our website and know where to go to be able to download our reports. We also encourage all of the blue suitors in the audience. We do publish forum papers, so if there's something from, from this conference or something else within your particular area of specialty that you think is important for policymakers, for senior leaders, and for industry to know, we do publish forum papers which are focused on highlighting your expertise and your thought leadership. Tim, again, thank you so much, Dr. Grayson. We appreciate uh, your being here, and John Deptula, always for your leadership. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.